Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Society presents this is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's file, The Sorrowful Swindler. Before opening tonight's file, it is my pleasure to bring you season's greetings from the Equitable Society. This week at the Equitable Society in the lobby of our home office building, we have decorated one of the tallest Christmas trees in New York. And this very afternoon, as we gathered round this tree and the sound of the traditional carols echoed through the halls, there was one pleasant thought that kept coming to our minds. We thought of all the homes in this country that are celebrating Christmas more merrily, more securely. We thought of all the children to whom Santa Claus will be more real, because someone in that home had the forethought to purchase life insurance. And we of the Equitable Society and the Equitable Society representatives all over America are happy to have done our share in bringing that kind of happiness to so many American homes this Christmas time. And so to each of our three and a quarter million members and to the other millions of Americans who enjoy this radio program, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States wish a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And now to the file on the Sorrowful Swindler. <laughs> With America virtually on the eve of celebrating her first peacetime Christmas in several years, the topic of crime seems hardly in keeping with the mood of the day. But then there is a negative kind of relationship between the two. Because it can be said truly that the doctrine of crime is the direct antithesis of the philosophy of Christmas. One is the religion of taking. The other the religion of giving. And to the criminal, Christmas time is no more than just another time in which to ply his profession of cheating, ply his profession of cheating, as demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Several years ago, during another Christmas season, a man using the alias of Colonel Weatherford and a companion in larceny were speeding eastward on a crack train headed for New York. You know, Colonel... Yeah? 
I still can't figure out how come we leave Chicago so quick. I think, Michael, we may sum it up in one word of two syllables. Like which? Police. You mean they were hep to us? They would have been, Michael, shortly after that check I cashed began to ricochet. Yeah, but suppose they get an idea we caught this train and they got the New York police waiting for us when we roll into Grand Central. Please, Michael. I'd rather not have to wrestle with that remote contingency for the moment. Huh? Allow me, if you will, to revel in a vision of the unbounded joy of my dear Valerie when I show her the fruits of this little mission to the West. You ain't going to give her the whole five grand. Valerie has demanded a mink coat of Santa Claus. And Valerie, my dear Michael, knows who Santa Claus is. Have your tickets ready, please. All right, get them right here, Colonel. May I check your tickets, please, madam? Oh, yes. Here's my ticket right here. Thank you. What time do we get to New York in the morning, Mr. Conductor? Nine o'clock. Well, I do hope my daughter is there to meet me. Sweet little old lady, ain't she? Yeah. You may keep uh, this part, madam. Oh, thank you. Oh, just a minute, please. Yes? I wonder if you'd help me. I have some stock certificates with me, which may be very valuable. Colonel, I'm listening. I'm kind of afraid to keep them in my berth with me tonight. Well, I'll be back directly, madam, and uh, we'll make some arrangements, I'm sure. Oh, thank you very much. Michael, I think Donder and Blitzen and the other tiny reindeer are about to make a landing on our own roof. Since crime never takes a holiday, neither does your FBI. And at about the same moment that the pompous gentleman on the New York-bound train became stock certificate-minded, Special Agent Barclay in the New York office of the FBI was handed a teletype from Washington. What does it say, Alan? Well, Jim, there goes my Christmas shopping push with Marjorie today. Oh? They want us to go to work on a swindler. Oh, anybody we know? No, he's avoided federal violations up to now. Well, what's the up to now? He put over a fraudulent deal in Denver a few days ago by posing as a United States attorney. Uh-oh. He may have stopped over in Chicago, but they believe he's headed for New York. Oh, is this his home? He's got a record here. Well, who is he? Several persons, it seems. Colonel Josiah Weatherford and about six others. Well, wow. Here, look this over and let's get busy. Right. While you're digesting the teletype, I'll check with the New York police. And also put a cover on railroad, plane, and bus terminals. <laughs> I didn't quite catch the name. Weatherford. Colonel Josiah Weatherford. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I'm Mrs. Greeley. How do you do? Uh, will you please sit down? Thank you. I came primarily to apologize for staring at you as I did. Oh, I didn't think anything about it. You see, you look so much like my own dear mother. Oh, then I feel quite honored. She passed on last March. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. This is to be my first Christmas without her. It'll be most desolate. Yes, I know it will. <sighs> you live in New York, Mrs. Greeley? Oh, no, no. It's too big a place for me. I'm just going there to spend Christmas with my daughter. How fortunate for your daughter. Oh, uh, I suppose that you live in New York? Well, I sort of divide my time between Chicago and New York. Uh -huh. I have an investment business with offices in both... Investment business, did you say? Yes, well, then maybe you'd know about my stock certificate. I beg your pardon? I mean, uh, know whether they're any good or not. Oh. Well, I don't know. May I see them? Oh, dear. I've already let the conductor put them away in a safe place for the night. Oh. You see, I was going to have them looked into while I was in New York. Uh, I could do that for you. You see, my husband has been dead about ten years, and I didn't know he'd left anything like that till... So the other day I was rummaging around in his old desk, and, well, there it was, a thousand shares all tied together. A thousand shares of what? A Lodestar Mining Company. What was that again? Lodestar Mining Company. Lodestar? That's what I thought you said. Do you know something about it? Uh, well, it's not listed on the exchange anymore that I know. Oh, then 
Then you mean it's, uh, it's no good? I wouldn't say that. I, I want to look it up for you. Oh. You will let me serve you in this, won't you? Oh, I'd be very glad if you would. Especially since that's your business. Well, now, you just leave everything to me and I'll be talking to you again in the morning before we get off the train. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, how'd you make out? Santa Claus is not merely knocking at our door, Michael. He's trying to break in with a pack full of gold. Special Agent Farrell speaking. Morning, Jim. This is Alan. Hey, say, where are you? Grand Central, waiting to cover the Manhattan Limited when it gets in. Good. I was just going to have to hop over there myself. What's up? Well, Weatherford's on that train. How do you know? A teletype just came in from Chicago. He passed a bad check there yesterday. And the ticket agent at LaSalle Station remembers selling Weatherford and a man with him space on the Manhattan. Then I'd better run. It's about to pull in. Right. <laughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Barkley. A man of that description occupied space in car 254. Then what happened to him, Porter? Well, uh, he and the fellow with him got off at Harmon this morning. Uh-oh. Well, I sure wish I'd have known earlier. Well, we didn't know ourselves in time to be prepared for that trick. Well, thanks anyway. Uh, oh, say, uh, uh, wait a minute. Yes? There's somebody might know something about him, and maybe she's still in the station. Who? A little old lady who had the space across the aisle from there. Oh? This man gave me a note when I got off at Harmon to give to her when she got up. What does she look like? Well, her name is Greeley. And she's about five foot two, gray hair, and she's wearing... Michael. Yeah? Valerie's waiting in the apartment here for me. I prefer to see you alone. Yeah, I prefer the same thing. I'll wait for you downstairs. Splendid. Valerie? Valerie? I'm in here. Valerie, my darling, come here. Wait a minute. Not so fast. But, my dear, aren't you glad to see me? I don't know. How was your trip? How was it? Look, my sweet. Here. Five thousand dollars. Let me see one of the bills. They're genuine, every last one of them. Oh, my darling, I am so glad to see you. I have <laughs> missed you so much. Ah, and now I can go right down this very day and get my mink coat. Oh. Well, you see, Valerie. What's the matter? Well, naturally, you're going to get the fur coat, Valerie. That's right. But tomorrow will be ample time. What is my sweet? I'm waiting for the hook. What is it? I merely want to retain possession of the money for the balance of the day. Go on. For five dollars a share, darling, I can pick up a thousand shares of Lodestar mining stock from a party who doesn't know their true value. Have they got any true value? Have they? Lodestar merged a few years ago with Rocky Mountain. Each share of Lodestar is still exchangeable for one share of Rocky Mountain, with today one hundred dollars a share. You mean put out 5000 and get back 100000 Exactly. Look, a mink coat on the back is worth 40 in the window. Nothing doing. Well, darling, you can't... You just dreamed this up to keep from coming across... I you. swear I didn't, Valerie. She's going to call me any minute. What, she... Now, don't get excited, my dear. Don't get excited. It's a little old lady. A Mrs. Greeley I met on the train. She has the stock. Oh, yeah? That's probably Mrs. Greeley now. <laughs> Colonel Weatherford speaking. Oh, hello, Mrs. Greeley. Are you at your daughter's now? No. No, she lives in the country and she didn't get my telegram until this morning. Oh, but she'll be in for me this evening. Oh, I see. Uh, it was snowing, so I took a room in a little hotel not far from the station to wait for her. Of course. Well, Mrs. Greeley, I have some good news for you about your stock. Oh, you have? How would you like to have $5,000 in cash for a Christmas present? $5,000? That's right. Good gracious. Now, uh, you just give me the name of your hotel, and I'll be right over in a few minutes. You mean we'll be right over. Alan. Yes, Jim? Well, I mushed over as soon as I could. Good. I think this is our best prospect of getting a line on Weatherford. Mm -hmm. The Greeley woman checked her bag at the station, huh? Yeah. 
You got anything out of the conductor? Mrs. Greeley gave him what she said was some stock certificates to keep safe for her last night. Oh? Weatherford was across the aisle and saw it all. I see. Ten to one, he's trying to pull a swindle on her for that stock. Well, I hope she comes back for her bag before the job's done. Yes, but she checked it two hours ago. And a lot can happen in two hours. Colonel Weatherford. Yes? Uh, if the Lodestar Mining Company is out of existence, I, I don't see why the group this young lady represents wants to buy my star. Oh, you should make that clearer, Colonel Weatherford. Uh, the group still controls the Lodestar Company's property, Mrs. Greeley. Oh. And they're going to start operating again. And they're willing to pay five, five, let's say $5 a share for all the old outstanding stock. Well, maybe I'd better hold on to mine, and maybe it'll be worth more after a while. Oh, oh, explain it to her, Colonel. It may be years before it's worth a cent more, Mrs. Greeley, and after all, $5,000 is a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, well, I'll trust your judgment, Colonel Weatherford. Good, I'm sure you won't regret it. Do you, uh, have all that money with you? Yes, here it is. $5,000. Fifty one hundred dollar bill. Gracious me! Now, if you have the stock for you. Oh, of course, yes. It's right here in my handbag. Splendid. Yes. <laughs> yes. Here we are. Mm -hmm. And now I want you both to put up your hands. What? What's the meaning of that gun? Oh, it merely means that I know as much about Lodestar as you do, you old swindler. <laughs> and I wish I did have some of the stuff. Well, now, look here, you, you can't... You asked her if she didn't want $5,000 for a Christmas present, didn't you? But, but I... Well, have... I'm not going to give up my mink coat uh, this uh, easy. Uh, 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 uh. Be nice now. And back into that closet over there. Both sell you. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe somebody will open it before Christmas. <laughs> Crooks don't qualify as men of goodwill, do they? So let's leave them for a moment while I tell you about someone you like. A man who is bubbling over with the contagious good humor that infects all good people this time of year. This week at the Equitable Society, I met a senior vice president coming out of the building. He was carrying a regular pyramid of packages in his arms. And just as I said hello to him... Something went wrong with the middle of the pyramid, and half of his packages fell out of his arms and slid to the floor. Serves me right, he laughed as I helped him to pick him up. Just what I deserve for putting off my Christmas shopping till the last minute and then trying to do it all at once. He paused and chuckled. And I'm the man who's spent his life telling folks not to put things off. My business in life is telling folks not to put off buying the life insurance protection they need. Well, I said, that's not such a bad way to spend your life, is it? We smiled and answered, saying, Yes, there are a lot of people in this world who are much happier right now because someone from the Equitable Society kept urging a husband or father not to put off buying life insurance. Believe me, that's a pretty pleasant thought for a fellow to entertain this time of year. Well, as I said goodbye to him, the thought came to me that it'd be a very fine thing if all members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States had the same opportunity to know the officers of their society that I have. Could get to know the sincerity and human understanding that they put into their daily work managing the life insurance of three and a quarter million Equitable Society members. I've met all these men. And I've yet to find any stuffing in any one of their shirts or any brass in any one of their hats. No matter how important their jobs are, their doors are always open and their time is always at the disposal of members of this Life Assurance Society. You see, the officers of the Equitable Society are the kind of men who take pride in the thought that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the file on the sorrowful swindler. (laughs) 
There is a saying that no one is so easily swindled as a swindler. And the victim, intending himself to commit a crime, can ill afford to complain to the law. Therefore, being denied recourse to the law, he usually takes matters into his own hands and generally with the same net result. Both are caught. At the moment, however, the little gray-haired confidence woman is trudging through the snow away from the hotel with $5,000 in $100 bills while behind the locked door of the closet in the hotel room. But, Valerie, darling... Don't darling me, you financial wizard. Nagging me is not going to get us out of here. You just be glad it's a closet where there's not room enough to swing at you. Michael's waiting just outside the hotel. Sure, probably building a snowman. But he's surely seen the woman leaving by herself. Oh, of course, of course. He probably helped her across the street. You'd think he'd suspect something and come up here to see about us? Oh, no, that calls for thinking. Valerie, if you'll help me push against the door just once more, I'm sure we can force it. I should knock myself out getting you out of a closet. Look, you're in here, too. You got us in, you get us out. Very well. Five thousand and get back a hundred thousand. Can't miss. It's a sin. Oh, for heaven's sake, Valerie, shut up. There. Come on. Let's get out of here quickly. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I'm warning you. I'm getting a mink coat tomorrow or else. Or else what? Or else the police are going to learn where you got that five thousand in the first place. But, Valerie, darling, you can't. You heard me. <laughs> it's the mink or the clink. Well, it doesn't look like our Mrs. Greeley's coming back for a bag. Yes, she only checked it a couple of hours ago. Give her time. Yes, but in the meantime, this weather hey, could have... This looks like our little lady now. Yeah, uh, seems to fit her description all right. And she's going over to the baggage counter. Come on. No, wait a minute. What? For one thing, somebody's trailing her. Huh? Look over there. And according to the conductor's description, that would be Weatherford's pal. Yeah, you're right. And item number two, do you know who our Mrs. Greeley really is? No. I had dealings with her a couple of years ago. That's an old-time operator who's known as Larson Annie. What? So far as Weatherford and she are concerned, I'd say at this point it's a question of who has done what to whom. Well, then let's pick them up and ask some questions. And miss getting Weatherford? Hey, look, there she goes. And a shadow, too. Come on, Jim. Let's make it a convoy. What good is it going to do to come back here to the apartment? Michael wasn't in front of the hotel, was he? So what? Darling, please. Patience and fortitude. Probably saw the woman leave and suspect... Oh, just a minute. Hello? This is Mike. Say, what's going on? Where the devil are you, Michael? I seen the old lady leave the hotel by herself, and I said something's crazy about this. Where's she now? I'm in a telephone booth at the State National Bank. I said, where is she? She's standing in line with a deposit slip and a fistful of dough. Oh. What happened? We've been robbed, Michael. Yeah? Don't take your eyes off her until she holds up somewhere and then call me, do you hear? Sure, I If you. you slip up, Michael, it'll be a cheerless Christmas for you and me. What do you mean? Did you ever spend Christmas behind the bars, Michael? Not yet. Then do what I tell you or you will. Here comes Larson and his shadow back from the phone. He must have contacted Weatherford. What do you make of all this? I'd say that Weatherford has now learned how it feels to be swindled himself. Well, he took somebody for the money first, and now Annie's taken him. Yes, which puts it up to us to take them both. Well, what's your idea? You stay here and keep your eyes open. And you? If Weatherford's pal saw me talking to Annie, what would he probably think? Well, that you were a confederate of hers, maybe. That's all I wanted to be sure of. What? Maybe this will do the trick, Jim. Come, darling. 
Let me help you trim the Christmas tree. You better get out and trim somebody for that mink coat. I tell you, I'm waiting on a telephone call from Michael. I'm surprised he can even use a telephone. You should not disparage Michael's intelligence, my dear. Ha! Providence beat me to it. Michael is a simple soul, but a loyal one with a great amount of common sense. And on occasion displays a flash of superior intelligence. Maybe you ought to be working for him, then. May I fix your cocktail? No, and don't try to soften me up because I'm... Yes? It's me, Colonel. Well? I done what you told me. Where is she? You better meet me quick. Corner of Madison and 91st. There are four corners, Michael, you know. Yeah, but I'll be standing on just one of them, boss. East side, downtown. You better hurry. I'll be there right away. You mean we'll be there? Then come on quickly, my dear. Now you shall have that mink. Yes, sir. Uh, Valerie, my dear. Okay, okay. Here you are, driver. Oh, thanks, miss. All right, where is he? Uh, right over there. Michael. Oh, hiya. Where's the woman? I done a good job of trailing her. You ought to be proud of her. I said, where is she? Right in that brownstone house. Well, what are we waiting for? Lead the way, Michael. Okay, come on. She went right in here, the ground floor. This better work. Please, my dear. Yes? Greetings, Mrs. Greeley. Well, come right in. Go ahead, darling. Hmm. Michael. I dare say you're a trifle surprised to see us again. Well, as a matter of fact, Colonel Weatherford, I am a little surprised the way things turned out, but... We rather expected you'd come here. Who's we? Yes, what do you mean? What she means, Weatherford, is that you're uh, all under arrest. What? <laughs> what is this? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? This is an apartment that we used on another case. It was also convenient to bring Mrs. Greeley here for questioning. We hoped you'd follow her. You mean she's working with you? Oh, not willingly, Colonel. But as you know, this is the Christmas season, and it's full of surprises for everyone. And now, your FBI would like to take this opportunity to wish for all of you a Merry Christmas and a happy, peaceful, and prosperous New Year. And through your continued support and cooperation, it will go on protecting your right to enjoy them year after year. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for the Financial Security of Life Insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society agent, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder on the High Seas. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. 
Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Midway through tonight's program, we shall have the special pleasure of bringing you once again one of America's best-loved businessmen, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society. Tonight's file, Murder on the High Seas. The international thief, whose criminal activities were curtailed by wartime restrictions on ocean travel, is now at work again along the ship lanes of the world. The international thief is the cleverest of his breed. Because of the scope of his activities, it is difficult for the law to detect his work and track him down. But when he commits a crime on a vessel flying the American flag, he finds himself up against the forces of your FBI. It is 9.30, and the small American freighter Edna May out of Maracaibo continues steadily on its northward course toward New Orleans. In his cabin under the bridge, Captain Peterson has been dinner host to two of the ship's passengers, Dr. Myler and his secretary. They have just finished their coffee. Have a cigar, Doctor? No, oh, thank you, Captain. I prefer my pipe. Yeah, it's been a delicious dinner. Do you agree, Karen? Well, with two such charming companions, I must say I hardly noticed the food. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see, Captain, why I engaged her as my secretary. Indeed, I can. <laughs> Beg your pardon, Captain. Yes, Mr. Ramey. Glass is falling, sir. Looks like it's making up in the Northwest. Secure everything. I'll be along. Right, sir. Well, I, I'm afraid, folks, it's going to get a little rough. Well, then we better make for our cabins while we can still stand up. Good night, Captain, and thanks for your hospitality. Yes, it's been charming. This was my pleasure. Now, good night, Captain. Good night. Good night. Good night. Karen, uh, give me your hand. Mm -hmm. A very entertaining man. Yes, he's delightful. We go around the radio shack here. Very well. Oh, wait a minute. What is it? My bag. I've left it in the captain's cab. Oh, I'll get it for you, my dear. You go on ahead to your cabin. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> oh, nonsense. It's getting rough. I'll be careful. I will. Who are you? I say, who are you and why are you standing... <coughs> But I left him just a few minutes ago, Captain. It, it's incredible. I know, Miss Brenner. How did it happen? Your fellow passenger here, Mr. Hanley, found the body. Yes, uh, purely by accident. I was taking a turn around the deck when I fairly stumbled over the doctor. He was between the radio shack and the captain's cabin here. 
Where did he leave you, Miss Brenner? At the after ladder. He was coming back here to get my bag. I see. Can you think of any motive for his being killed? Yes. Yes, Captain, there was plenty of motive. What do you mean? Dr. Marler was in a Nazi concentration camp. The report was that he had died there. Actually, with the help of friends, he escaped to South America. Yes? In South America, he fought the Nazis just as he had fought them at home. But the war is over now. All the Nazi troublemakers have not been caught, Captain. You think he was killed because of this? He must have been. He was on his way to the States to tell what he knew. Do you know of anyone on board who might have had a reason to kill Dr. Myler? No. We never knew Mr. Hanley or your other passenger, Mr. Dargan, until we boarded ship. Uh, excuse me, Captain. Yes, Hanley? Of course, I don't wish to create any trouble for a fellow passenger, but... Uh, well? I saw Mr. Dargan on deck just before I discovered Dr. Myler's body. What was he doing? Walking rather hurriedly away from where the body was found. Well... I think we should have a talk with Mr. Dargan. I'll have the steward get him up here at once. Come in. I have Mr. Dargan here, Captain. Uh, bring him in, steward. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Hi, Miss Brenner. Mr. Dargan. Hanley. Hello, Dargan. Mr. Dargan. Do you know why I sent for you? Yeah, the uh, steward gave me a fill-in. It's too bad. I am trying to check on everyone's activities. Can you tell me what you've been doing for the past hour? Yeah, I was in my cabin most of the time. Were you on deck at all? For a while. Why? Mr. Hanley here discovered the body. It was between my cabin and the radio shack. Yeah? He told me that just before this discovery, he saw you on deck. So what? You were walking away from where the body was found. If it was near the radio shack, he was right. I was in there sending a message. You can check that with your operator. I will. Who was with Hanley when the body was found? I was alone. Why? Maybe somebody ought to check up on you. <laughs> now, see, I here. believe you're in the mining business, Mr. Dargan. That's right. Have you ever had any dealings with the Nazis in South America? Are you kidding? We just fought a war with them, remember? Captain... I wonder if I might go to my cabin. Oh, yes, yes. Go ahead, Miss Brenner. I'm going to question these men a bit further and then radio a report to the federal authorities. Uh, Steward. Yes, sir? Uh, take Miss Brenner below. Yes, sir. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night Miss Brenner. Good night. Go ahead, Miss. Thank you, Steward. This way, Miss. Never mind the act, you fool. What do you mean? You bungled the job. What are you talking about? Why didn't you throw the body overboard? I never had the chance. Why? Somebody beat us to the job. Hello, Tom. Yes, Nick. Radio message from the captain of the freighter Edna May, bound for New Orleans. There's been a murder on board. Oh? A Dr. Heinrich Myler escaped to South America two years ago from a German concentration camp. Oh. He was accompanied by his secretary, Karen Brenner. Oh, and uh, seems both originally from Vienna. Radio the captain to send us a list of his passengers right away and all details he has on them. Mm, what about the crew? Well, there's a possibility he took on a hand or two at Maracaibo we can't check on at this end. Get that information, too. Right. Meantime, we'll go to work on Myler and Brenner. <laughs> Who is it? Message for you, Miss Brenner. Mr. Dark. That's right, baby. The first name is Sam. What's the meaning of this? I guess you might call it a business call. I don't know what you're talking about, but please leave. Look, baby, I just came here. Please, I don't feel well. I'm terribly upset. Over the doctor? Yes. Now get out of here. I told you this was a business call. The business is why the doc died. What do you mean? Well, it's uh, kind of a long story, but if I were you, I'd listen, baby. Well? When the Nazis invaded France, they helped themselves to a lot of things that didn't belong to them. When they left France, some of those things weren't uh, returned. Yes? 
One of these light-fingered Nazis was a guy named Carl von Ritter. His touch was paintings, paintings stolen from a gallery in Paris. Look, I am not interested Just in... listen. This von Ritter guy took these paintings to South America with the idea that eventually he'd bring them to the States and make a nice score. Uh, only he didn't quite make it. You know why, don't you? You know that the doc was really Carl von Ritter. That's not oh, true. Oh, now look, baby, I did a lot of research on this. It's a lie, I tell you. Suppose we let the captain decide that. Come on, let's tell him the story. Wait a minute. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> uh, now you're talking, sweetheart. Where are the paintings? I don't know. Now, wait a minute. I swear look, I don't. Look, you were working this thing with him, weren't you? Weren't you? I knew who he was, yes. And you know about the painting? I didn't know where he kept them. Somebody did. That's why the guy was killed. Then find out from whoever killed him. Oh, baby, that's why I came here. I had nothing to do with his death. Look, you and that guy, Hanley, are working on this thing together. Hanley? I pegged him the minute they came aboard ship. He's a larceny guy from way back. I never saw him before in my life. Stop, will you? I swear it. Okay, maybe you're leveling. But if you are, you got real trouble. How? Hanley must have killed the doctor. The chances are you're next on his list. Oh. You still got one chance. What? We become partners. How do I know you didn't kill the doctor? You don't, but I didn't. How do I know I can trust you? You don't, but you got to play ball with me. Now, where did he keep the paintings? In a secret compartment in his trunk. That's my girl. Let's nail him now. <laughs> Here's the Edna May's passenger list, Tom. Just came in. Good. There are only four passengers aboard. I see. Did you get a call back on Myler and Miss Brenner yet? Not yet, Nick. They're still checking. Mm -hmm. Captain Peterson took on two hands at Maricabo. Yes, I see. An oiler and a steward. Shall I start a check on them, Tom? Yes, and on these passengers, too. Grady speaking. Huh? Definitely, huh? What about Brenner? Uh huh. All right, send over the files on them, please, and thanks. Well, Dr. Heinrich Myler died two years ago in a concentration camp. Then who was the murdered man? We've got to find that out. Tom, what about Miss Brenner? Been in South America four years, suspected of having worked with Nazi agents, but nothing was ever proved. You think she could have killed a man? We can't think anything yet, Nick, until we get the answers to an awful lot of questions. When is the ship due at New Orleans? Sometime tomorrow, if the... The storm she's in now doesn't delay her too much. Well, we got some fast work to do. We can make that 8 o'clock plane for New Orleans. Radio the captain. We'll board the ship when she drops anchor in midstream for inspection. All right. Meanwhile, we've got to find out who Dr. Myler really is. Isn't this his cabin here? Yes, there we are. Go ahead, baby. All right. The lights are right we over... We ain't putting on any lights. I've got a flash here. There. Now, where's the truck? Right in the corner. Okay. Where's the secret compartment? In the bottom. Hey, this trunk is locked. I have a key for it. It's back in my cabin. That's great. Go get it quick. Very well. Who's that? <gasps> This week at the Equitable Society, I happened to hear President Thomas I. Parkinson talking about New Year's resolutions. And some of the things he said impressed me so much that I've asked him to repeat them in person to our radio audience tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I take pleasure in introducing Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. 
Thank you, Carl Frank, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In three days and a few hours from now, the bells will be ringing, the whistles will be blowing, and people will be saying Happy New Year to one another. Since I won't be able to be with you at that moment, I'll have to give you my good wishes in advance. So a happy and prosperous New Year to all of you, from me personally and from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I think everybody realizes that this year, 1946, we are soon to enter, will be a critical year in the history of civilization, the beginning of a new age for the whole world. So when we make our New Year's resolutions, isn't this a good time for all Americans to reaffirm their faith in the traditional American virtues of thrift, neighborly cooperation, and self-reliance? In all past times of crisis, those three qualities have stood us in good stead. We've depended on them before. We can depend on them again. Of course, when I say traditional American virtues, I don't mean that we Americans have any monopoly on them. The Scotch, for example, are celebrated for their thriftiness. The Scandinavian people are famous for the success of their cooperative movements. But in all history, in all the world, no other nation has ever beaten America on self-reliance. I believe that this is a matter of inheritance. After all, every citizen of this country, if he goes back far enough, is descended from emigrants. And that's something to be proud of. Any emigrant is a man or a woman who had the courage and initiative to leave his homeland and cross an ocean in search of greater opportunity and greater freedom. That's the pioneer spirit. And this same spirit of self-reliance is the backbone of our American system of free enterprise today. Self-reliance is what makes a man start a little business and then develop that little business into a big business. Self-reliance is what makes a man buy a farm, build a home of his own, and plan things so that his children will get a first-class education. For 86 years, the organization of which I have the honor to be president, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, has been working with Americans who practice the virtues of thrift, cooperation, and self-reliance. You see, when a man buys future security in the form of life insurance, he gives a perfect demonstration of self-reliance. He proves that he believes in taking care of himself and his family, no matter what happens. He proves that he believes in standing on his own two feet. Furthermore, our society is strictly a cooperative enterprise, owned entirely by its members and run solely for their benefit. Thanks to the thrift of our three and a quarter million members, a great protective fund has been built up which gives every individual member far more security than he could achieve by his own unaided efforts. Thrift, neighborly cooperation, and self-reliance, these are the qualities that have made the Equitable Society strong. They are also the qualities which have made America strong. The more we practice those three virtues in the future, the more certain we can be of a happy new year in 1946 and of happy new years for many years to come. And now back to the file on Murder on the High Seas. Many unusual methods have been employed by your FBI in the solution of crimes. Tonight's file is an example of this. A murder is committed on the high seas. FBI agents have neither seen the corpse nor interviewed the suspect. Nevertheless, they are already gathering facts, building evidence that will ultimately lead to the apprehension of the killer. The killer is still at large, however. And aboard the freighter Edna May, in a cabin below deck, Sam Dargan, victim of an unknown assailant, lies unconscious on the floor. Dargan. Mr. Dargan. Oh. <gasps> Mr. Dargan, what's wrong? What happened? Oh, my head. What happened somebody, to you? Somebody slugged me. Who? I don't know. I, I was... Wait a minute. Yes. Did you really leave this room? But of course. Why? I heard the door close, but I might have stayed here. I didn't look around. Look, here's the trunk key. I went to my stateroom. Look, room. put on those lights. I did when I heard you moaning. Turn them off. Look. Where? The trunk, it's been opened. Hey, what is this? It's been rifled. The secret compartment is open. The paintings are gone. Hanley. What? This is Hanley's work, baby. You mean he has the paint? Sure. But he ain't gonna have him for long. Well, 
Good morning, Captain. Well, good morning, Mr. Hanley. May I fall in with you? Of course. You're up and about rather early, aren't you? Oh, yes, I'm always an early riser at sea. You sleep well? Yes, like a top, sir. Um, anything new in the killing? No. I'm just waiting now to turn it over to the FBI. Good morning, Captain. Well, Mr. Dargan, Miss Brenner. Good morning, Captain. Looks like a lot of early risers this morning. Yeah. Good heavens, Dargan. What? Your head, the bandage, what happened? I took a pretty good wallop last night, Hanley. Oh, how was that? I got a little restless and took a walk. And just as I came to Dr. Myler's cabin... Yes? Uh, that's uh, where it happened. What do you mean? Oh, the ship did a half roll, Captain. I banged my head on a brass fitting. Oh, well, that's too bad, old man. Yes. Um, what time are we due at New Orleans, Captain? We ought to drop hook in about an hour. Good. Well, uh, uh, shall we continue our stroll, sir? Very well. Will you join us, folks? I uh, know, thank you. Uh, see you later, then. Uh, cheerio. I was watching Hanley's face when you told the story. He's the one, all right. Sure. We arrive in an hour. What are you going to do? You make sure that he stays on deck. I'm going down now and case out his cabin. Well, what happened? No dice. What? I went through everything in Hanley's cabin. The paintings aren't there. What will we do? Where is Hanley? Up forward there. Come on, we're going to talk to that guy. What good will that do? At least I can find out if he really slugged me. It still could have been you, sweetheart. Now, look. Shut up. Hanley. Uh, yes, old boy? I want to talk to you. Very well. Uh, this uh, a slug on the head I got last night, you know how it really happened, don't you? Yes, I heard your story. Quit stalling. I know all about you, Hanley. You work on the same side of the street that I do. I'm afraid I don't follow you. Larceny Boulevard, mister. You gave it to me last night in the doctor's cabin, and you were there for the same reason I was. Mrs. Brennan, what's he talking about? Look, she belongs to the same club, too. Now, where are the paintings? Uh, what paintings? I'm giving you one chance, Hanley. Either you play with us on a three-way cut or everybody falls. There's a boat pulling alongside. That's probably the G-men, Hanley. You know, the FBI. Now, talk fast. Very well, but, uh... What I have to say will be very disappointing. I give you my word, I have not got the paintings. Captain, I think you should know some of the facts we've already assembled on this case. You mean you have something just from that list of names I sent you, Mr. Grady? Yes. Dr. Myler's real name was Carl von Ritter. He was a Nazi who fled to South America. You understand he had in his possession some very valuable paintings. Stolen, I suppose. Yes. We can assume that he had them with him aboard ship here, that he hoped to dispose of them in the States. Yes? Oh, come in, Mr. Jackson. Thanks, Captain. How'd you make out, Nick? I searched Von Ritter's cabin. And? I found a trunk that had been forced open. Mm -hmm. There was a secret compartment in the bottom. It was empty. Yeah. Paintings were probably in that trunk. They must have been, Tom. There's no trace of them anywhere else. That Brenner girl sounds like the logical suspect, gentlemen. Could have been neither of your passengers, too, Captain. Hanley or Dargan? Yes, we're waiting for information on them now. It also could have been that steward you took on at Maracaibo. What? In fact, he's the first man we'd like to talk to, if you'd be good enough to send for him, Captain. Surely. <laughs> Send for me, Captain. Yes, Steward. Uh, this gentleman is a special agent of the FBI. I see. He wants to talk to you about the death of Dr. Myler. I'm afraid I know nothing about it. Then let me tell you something I know. What do you mean? Your real name is not Paul Mason. It's Max Schmidt. Uh, that's true, but... But I tell you, I didn't... Wait have... a minute. You and your oiler friend jumped a Swedish ship six weeks ago in a South American port. Well, what if we did? Police down there keep pretty good track of strangers, Schmidt. That's how they were able to tell us about your contacts with Miss Brenner. Shall I go any farther? All right. Miss Brenner did hire us to make this trip and help forge our papers and everything so we could sign on the ship. And you were supposed to kill Dr. Myler and get part of the money from the sale of the paintings. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. No? What happened? The oiler and I decided not to go through it. Hmm. 
Excuse me, Tom. Yes, Nick. The wireless room just gave me this. I see. Oh, that'll be all now, Stuart. You can go. Yes, sir. Well, this is the information we wanted on Dargan and Hanley. Both of their records would fill a book. Well. Captain. Yes? I'm going to call on you for some help. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Well, Captain, it's very gracious of you to tender us a farewell dinner. This was by request, Mr. Hanley. Really? Whose request? The special agents of the FBI. What was their point? Well, for one thing, Mr. Dargan, they wanted to be sure they'd know where you all were. Stuart? Uh, yes, Smith? Some more coffee, please. Surely. They also wanted to acquaint you with a few facts. Like what? Like who murdered Dr. Myler. They have learned who the killer is, Captain. They have plenty of suspects. For instance... All of you know that Dr. Myler was really Carl von Ritter. He was attempting to smuggle some valuable paintings into the States. And uh, how could we know that, Captain? Well, for one thing, Mr. Hanley, you dropped your initial cigarette case in von Ritter's cabin last night while you were rifling it for the paintings. The cigarette case doesn't prove that. The lump on Mr. Dargan's head does. What? There was no blood on the brass fittings outside of von Ritter's cabin, Mr. Dargan, where you might have bumped your head. But there was some on the floor inside the cabin. That doesn't make me the killer, Captain. I'd say whoever has the paintings committed the murder. The paintings have been found. What? Where? In one of the crew's quarters. Uh, all right. Uh, stay where you are, all of you. Put, uh, put, put down that gun, Stuart. Huh? Oi! Take care of him, will you, Nick? Right. He is the killer? Yes. He told us all about his deal with you, Miss Brenner. We figured if he'd do that, he'd also double-cross you. That's why we searched his quarters. Now, Captain, you may proceed, if you wish, to dock the Edna May. The subsequent finding of the murderer's weapon led to the trial and conviction of the ship's steward on the charge of first-degree murder. Hanley... Dargan and Miss Brenner were sentenced to the federal penitentiary for their part in the conspiracy. Their apprehension is a reminder that wherever the American flag flies as a symbol of civil authority, your FBI is on the job day and night, enforcing the law of the land on all who conspire against it. Before you hear about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, may the Equitable Society again wish you a happy and prosperous New Year. Just as you look to the FBI for national security, you look to the Equitable Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the same spirit in which it has lived through 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States shall, throughout 1946 and the years to come, continue, like your FBI, to be dedicated to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Crime in the Roaring Twenties. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
For this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, this first broadcast of 1946... This first week in January is a good time to look forward into the future and back at the past. We of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States are happy to report that the end of World War II finds our society in a stronger position than ever before. Our membership, our assets, and the amount of life insurance owned by our members increased during the war years. So the Equitable Society has weathered this war as successfully as it did three previous wars and seven major depressions. We wish to report also that in the future, as in the past, the premium dollars of Equitable Society members will be invested in ways that benefit the entire country. And by serving its members, the Equitable Society will continue to serve America. Tonight's file, Crime in the Roaring Twenties. This week, as America begins the first year of another post-war era, she faces here at home, just as she did some 25 years ago, those many grave problems which grow out of war. But of them all, none is a greater menace to the right of American citizens to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness than that problem which is splashing more and more black ink across the front pages of our newspapers every day. Crime. Addressing the International Association of Chiefs of Police recently, Director J. Edgar Hoover of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, your FBI, uttered this warning. After every great war, there has been a recession of moral fortitude. This one will be no exception. I hope, as you do, that the racketeers, the overlords, the desperados, and the criminal scum who characterize the Roaring Twenties will not come back to the American scene. I fear, however, that this is wishful thinking. Once they get a start and find they can succeed, we shall face very serious trouble. It is the delinquent youngster of the war years who is now graduating into the ranks of seasoned criminals. They are now becoming the postgraduates of crime and are committing the more despicable offenses. It was the delinquent youngsters of 1917 and 18 who graduated into the seasoned criminals of that post-war era who made the Roaring Twenties roar. Roar with the explosions of pistols, machine guns, and pineapple bombs. Will it happen here again? This is how it happened then. This is how one delinquent youngster of 1917 became a postgraduate of crime in the Roaring Twenties. In the cellar room of the Black Cat Club, the roadhouse just outside a large Midwestern city, the slot machines and dice games, as usual, were taking more than giving. While upstairs on the main floor... The young hip blast set were drinking bootleg liquor in dim corners and dancing the black bottom to a pasty-faced orchestra. Presently, young Red Martin and two companions sweep into the room and take over a booth in a corner. Hey, waiter. Yeah? Get these guys a set up and bring me a Coke, will you? Okay. 
What's with the Coke? Why don't you take a real drink, Red? None of that rot got for me, pal. You can't make dough out of it, and ulcers too. And I'm gonna make dough out of it. Yeah? How do you mean? I'll tell you all about it in a minute. Hey, look. Yeah? A couple of dames over there making a big play. Forget them. I'll show you something with real class. Where? That blonde. Huh? There she goes now, toward the back. Hey. That's for me, fellas. Are you kidding, Red? You know who that is? That's Legs Miller's dame. I know. Guy that runs this joint? Yeah. Look, stupid. Don't you know who Legs Miller really is? Yeah, I know. He does a little bootlegging. A little? He ain't in the pint and quart business. He runs the stuff by the truckload. Yeah? Sure. And he's the guy I'm here to do business with. Are you huh? kidding, Red? Where are you set up, boys? Your coke, Red. Okay, say, uh, tell Casey I want to see him. Sure. Now, before this Casey gets here, I want to tell you guys something. Okay. Up to now, we've just been playing a nickel and dime rackets. It's time we graduated. How? Oh. We'll hook up with a gang like Legs Millers, make some real dough, and if we're smart, we'll have our own business before you know it, okay? Well... Well, gee, Red, I... Uh... What's the matter, you yellow? No, no, of course not, You want to but... see me, Red? Yeah. Well, what about? You know what about, Casey. Well, yeah, but Legs ain't... Don't the... give me that, he's here. I saw his dame go back a minute ago. Look, Red, the guy is busy. I want to see him, now. Okay, kid. Come on. Stick right here, boys. I'll be back with a deal. <laughs> Yeah, Casey. Hey, uh, you got a minute? What is it? I, uh, I got a guy here. I want you to talk to you. Okay, bring him in. You want me to leave? No, stick around, honey. Go ahead, Red. Okay. This here is Red Martin. Hiya. Hi, Legs. What do you want, kid? I want to talk business. I'm not a kid. <laughs> he means now he's shaving, honey. <laughs> but where did he get those big shoulders? You like him, sweetheart? What do you mean by that crack, kid? Darling, he means do I like him? And I do. Look, Legs, do you want to talk business or don't you? Okay, Mr. Martin. What kind of business? Did Casey tell you anything about me? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I got a proposition for you. Yeah? You've been doing pretty good for yourself, but you could be doing a whole lot better. No kidding. Yeah. Now, here's my deal. This will really put you on top. I got some guys, you got some guys. I bring my guys in and join up with you and work on a commission. Before you know it, everybody in the whiskey business is working for us. That's your proposition? Yeah. How's it sound to you? Casey, huh? bounce this bum. Wait a minute. I said bounce him. Keep away from me. I'll walk out of here under my own power. But I want you to remember something, Legs. Next time you and me get together, it'll be you that gets the bounce. What? And your dame here will get to stick around and try out these big shoulders. Why, you... What happened, Red? Did you make a deal? No. But I made a promise. So let's get started on it. What are we going to do? First, we're going to get lots of power on wheels somewhere. Come on. Crime, like history, repeats itself. This juvenile delinquent product of World War I has his counterpart today. Somewhere in the nation, a youngster like Red Martin may be planning a similar career of ruthless violence. Let him listen, then. Listen and learn. The first report on Red Martin is received in the local office of the FBI. Special Agent Brown speaking. Good morning, Mr. Brown. Police headquarters. I think this is one for you FBI fellas. All right. What is it? Morristown across the state line last night. Yes? Three young fellas stuck up an all-night garage and auto storage, slugged the man on duty, and escaped with a black Cadillac sedan. Mm-hmm. Believe they came back across the state line with it. What are the details? The garage man gave a pretty fair description of them. I've got all the facts about the car. Good. What do the thieves look like? Uh, one of them was about five feet eleven, big shoulders, red hair, seemed to be the leader. The other two... Give me your light, will you, Casey? You better wait. We, uh, we 
We've got to stop for this railroad crossing, you know. <laughs> Don't worry. I ain't taking no chances with a load of legs, booze. Well, looks clear to me. Give me that light okay, before I can... Okay, put your hands up and get out of that... What is it? Hey, what's the idea? Shut up and get out of there quick. They ain't fooling, Casey. We better haul out. Yeah. Go ahead, kid. Right. And this is for not moving when I told you. Mm. Drag more to the ditch, Al, quick. Okay. Uh... You know where to drive the truck, Joe. Get at it. Sure. Casey, I guess we better rough you up a little, too, so everything will look on the up and up for you when your pal comes out of it. Okay. And you better not ride the next load we knock off. Legs might start wondering. Just tip me off about it. Right. Hey, you know something? What? Knocking off this truck makes me and Legs partners after all. What's the story, Bob? It's the Cadillac we're looking for, all right. And I've got some fingerprints. They abandoned it right at the scene of the hijacking? Yes. The watchman at the crossing who saw it take place, said one hijacker drove off with a truck, and while he was calling the police, the other two disappeared on the run down the tracks. What about the two men on the truck? He was sure one of them was slugged, but by the time he made the call and got over there, there wasn't a sign of anybody or anything but the Cadillac. Since the victims didn't bother to report to the police, that tells what was in the truck. Liquor. Exactly. But why did the hijackers leave the Cadillac there? They don't have to worry about a hot car anymore. They can buy their own now. He obviously stole it to pull this job and get a stake. The start of a new gang, eh? Yes. So let's get busy and find out who they are and see how soon we can stop them. Hiya, Red. Oh, hiya, Joe. I've been looking all over for you. What's the matter? Huh? Nothing. I just thought we might get a couple of dames and go dancing. I'm a scratch. Why? I already got a date. Oh, yeah? With who? Legs Miller's dame. Huh? Yeah, I sent word to her. I told her I'd be here. Oh, you did, huh? What makes you think she'll come? She'll come. You know, uh, you mean plenty of trouble, Red. This kind of trouble I like. Yeah, but if Legs finds out... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? You should come in the door. Blow, will you? Okay, but take it easy, will you, Red? Hello, shoulders. Hi, honey. Sit down. Thanks. You want a drink? No. Okay. How's legs? He's all right. Did you uh, tell him you were coming here? Now, what do you think? Well, he's got to know sooner or later. What do you mean? About us. <laughs> You're wonderful. That's right. What about us? We're in business, baby. Just like that, huh? Look, I had this figured months ago. And when I got ready for you, that's when I sent you the word. Really? Yeah. You see, there was a lot of things I had to do along the way. Get cars, which I got. Get dough, which I got. And now you. Which you ain't got. Don't be a sucker, baby. I'm your kind of guy. How do you figure that? You hear that music? Hear what the guy is playing? Yeah. That's my favorite song. That's why he's playing it. See the box there? Yes. It's loaded with them orchids. Your favorite flower. And I got an order in with the jeweler for a ruby ring. That's your favorite rock. How did you know all this? I done research on you, honey. Now you see what I mean? I'm your kind of guy. You're forgetting something, Red. What's that? Legs. What about him? He's going to have something to say about this. I figured that too, honey. You know something? I'm going to give him a chance to, to say it. i got to pay a call on Mr. Legs Miller tomorrow night. I found the dealer finally, Jim. Good. He sold them two second-hand Cadillacs. Here are the descriptions. Registered in what name? Jack Smith, obviously an alias. What did Jack Smith look like? The one with the red hair, according to the dealer. Uh -huh. There's a report from Washington. Those fingerprints, Jim. Thanks. 
Did we get anything? On the redhead, yes. His name is George Red Martin. Served six months in a reformatory in 1917. Here's the full description and photo is on the way. Good. I think I'd better get over to police headquarters and see if they have anything on the private life and public habits of said George Red Martin. All right, you guys, listen to me a minute, will you? Now, here's what I figure we do. Yeah? Hello, darling. Oh, hi, honey. Come on in. Hey, what is this, Legs? A convention? No, sweetheart. It's sort of like a reception committee. For who? Mr. Casey. Oh. The boys here got some kind of bad reports on him. Like what? He's been hanging around with that punk Red Martin, which just about accounts for a lot of that liquor we've been losing lately. Yeah? Hiya, Legs. Come on in, Casey. Okay. What is this, a meeting or something? Yeah. A real important meeting. It's about you. What do you mean? Where have you been tonight? Oh, I was, uh, I was just down collecting a little dough I had riding on an egg. Why? Let's see the dough. Oh, sure. Here, I... Ow! Get up. Now, wait a minute, Legs. What's the matter with you? The horse's name was Red Martin, wasn't it? Red Martin? I don't know what you're talking... Okay, boys. Pick him up. Take him out for a little ride. Now, wait a minute, Legs. Give me a chance, will you? Get him out of here, quick. All right, get him in the air, everybody. What? Cover him, boys. First one he makes a move for his heater gets a belly full of this. Hiya, honey. Hello, Red. Legs, this is what I told you would happen, remember? Yeah? I want all you guys to listen to me. I'm in and I'm taking over. And you don't want to play ball with me, line up against the wall and I'll check you off right now. Okay, then you're working for me. Hey, you, you come just in time, Red. Casey, get over there with Legs. What? I said get over there. Oh, sure, but... Uh... What's your idea? There ain't gonna be any double crosses in my outfit. Huh? You double cross legs, you might double cross me. Now take it, both of you. Oh, all right, wait a minute. Wait. Hey, honey, from now on, as long as you play it straight, these big shoulders are yours. Now, for a moment, let's talk about another kind of youngster. The kind of clean-cut American boy in a typical American home who is going to be one of America's worthwhile citizens. This week at the Equitable Society, one of the agents told me a story that gave me quite a kick. It seems that when he got home the other evening, his young son, Jimmy, aged eight, was chewing candy. Well, like fathers everywhere, he said... Don't eat that candy now, Jimmy. You'll spoil your dinner. Where'd you get the candy, anyway? Fred gave it to me, said Jimmy. His father's in the candy business, and he brings home samples. Say, Dad, why don't you ever bring home some life insurance samples? Well, Jimmy's dad tried to explain. Look, son, he said, life insurance isn't like candy. Candy is something you can see and feel and touch and taste right now. But life insurance... Well, now let's suppose that Fred's dad should die. There wouldn't be any more candy unless Fred's dad had arranged for life insurance to keep Fred supplied with candy and food and clothes. Well, Jimmy thought a minute, and then he said, I get it, I get it. Life insurance is candy for when the samples run out. Candy for when the samples run out. That's something to think about. Life insurance is candy for future delivery, security for tomorrow. Well, thinking about that makes us of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States feel pretty happy about the work we do. There's a real satisfaction in being in a business like this. You see, we always know that what we're doing today will benefit boys like Jimmy and millions of other young Americans far, far into the future. Yes, this week and every week for more than 86 years, 
the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the file on crime in the Roaring Twenties. Red Martin and his companions, delinquent youngsters of 1917, had now graduated into major crime. And together with thousands like themselves, whose potential counterparts after this war were to be far greater in number, had added the explosions of their guns to the roar of the Roaring Twenties. It is now some 30 or 40 minutes after Red Martin's blazing Tommy gun put him on the little throne which had been occupied by the man called Legs Miller. The murdered man has been discovered. The police notified. They, with special agents of the FBI, are now viewing the bodies. That's Legs, all right. The other one, I've heard him call Casey. Who did it, waiter, do you know? Uh, let me answer that, officer. It was Red Martin, wasn't it, waiter? Well, I... Uh... Uh, it's Red Martin and his gang who've been knocking off Legs Miller's trucks. Is that right? I've seen Casey and Red Martin together. But why did Casey get it? I guess Martin doesn't want any double crosses on his staff. Find anything, officer? A couple of slugs on the floor that went clear through him. I'd like to have them for a lab check, if you don't mind. Here you are. Obviously, Martin doesn't intend to do business here. No, uh, he'll probably set up a new headquarters. Waiter. Yes, sir. Did Legs Miller have a girlfriend? Yes, sir. Is this her picture on the desk here? Yes, sir. With all my love, honey. That's what she was called. We're taking this picture along, too, officer. All right, Mr. Brown. I guess we can go now. And let's keep our fingers crossed. This picture could be the clue to the whereabouts of Red Martin. Assuming you mean that when Red Martin takes over, he takes everything over. Right. Red. Yeah? What time is it? A little after ten. Thanks. <laughs> Matter of time? No, darling. Bored. What's the matter? Well, these past few days haven't been what you might call exciting. Now, look, honey, I told you. I know. You... We have to stay here until the heat's off. Couldn't you have picked someplace else for a hideout? Did it have to be two dingy rooms above a garage? We ain't gonna be here forever. We already have been. Who is it? Me, Al. Come on in. Blondie? Hello, Junior. Want to see me, Red? Yeah. Tell the boys that tomorrow we start expanding. You do? How? We're going to start taking over Mr. Cicero's customers. That's a big order. I'm a big guy. Tomorrow the boys start calling on Cicero's customers to tell them from now on they're buying from us, okay? It'll be okay until Cicero decides to pay us a visit. That's what I want. It'll be a quick way to take over. We'll be here waiting for them. Pass the word on, Al. All right. See you later. After Mr. Cicero, do we hide out again? Come here, baby. Well? Look, just play along with us for a few more days, will you? Oh, I wish you didn't have those big shoulders. <laughs> Good luck, Bob. Enough, I think. What do you mean? I checked the photographer this morning who made this picture of Honey. Well? He said all he knew, she was a nightclub singer. Uh -huh. So I checked with the booking offices, and I finally got this address. Whose? Her mother's, on the north side. I'm bound to see her mother once in a while. We'll keep a 24-hour surveillance on the house and wait for Honey to show up. <laughs> Brown speaking. Jim, the girl just came home to see her mother. Yes? Better get over here so we can follow her back and pick up Martin. You follow yourself, Bob, and then come on in. Why? I want to pick up everybody at once. Yes, but how? You keep tabs on Honey and find Martin's hideout. I think I've got a way for seeing that everybody is at home when we go calling. <laughs> Joe? 
Yeah? Stand over there by the window. Right. Now, find yourself by the door. Okay. And don't take any chances. Have your rods on that door when she opens. And, honey. Yes, sir. For the tenth time, go on back home to your mother's. Nothing doing. I'm staying here. Look, baby, that was Cicero that called and said he was coming over. Not a magazine salesman, Cicero. I'm not afraid of Cicero. So I suppose you like his shoulders, too. Darling. Okay, then get out of line of that door anyway. Hey, Red. Yeah? I right hear. How many? Three cars full. Get set for anything. They'll be upstairs any minute. But they won't all come up here. Never mind what stays downstairs. Just take care of what comes in that door. That's all we hey. have to... Listen, Red. Only one guy coming up. Yeah. Must be Cicero himself. Gonna try talking first, I guess. Can we let him have it when he comes in? I'll take care of him. Come in. Evening. That's not Cicero. Hey. Who are you, pal? I'm Special Agent Brown of the FBI. FBI? You better get out of here. There might be a lot of shooting in a minute. There'll be an awful lot if any of you starts at Martin. Those are FBI agents down there, and they're ready to blast you to kingdom come. But Cicero I'm just... afraid I'm guilty of impersonating Cicero, Mr. Martin. What? We just wanted to show you how easily you boys can be taken over, that's all. Now drop your guns and file quietly downstairs. We'll go to headquarters and arrange futures for one and all. Young Red Martin's short and unprofitable career of crime ended with his death in the electric chair. The members of his mob were sentenced to long terms in prison. That was a page out of the Roaring Twenties, part of the criminal aftermath in America of World War I. Already the criminal aftermath of World War II is splashing black ink across the front pages of our newspapers. It happened before... It can happen here again. The FBI and your local law enforcement officers will fight it day and night. But it must be fought by all the people if it is to be licked. What are you doing about it in your community? Before we tell you about next week's case from the files of the FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To the FBI, America looks for national security. And to the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans look for the financial security of life insurance. These three and a quarter million people are the sole owners of the Equitable Society. Because, you see, the moment they purchased life insurance through an Equitable Society agent, they became part owners of this great mutual organization. Yes, like your FBI, the Equitable Society representative in your community is constantly working for the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. But all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.